All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the fifth day of September in the year of our Lord, 2023. And I'd like to continue on with uh, why I believe we are living in the time immediately prior to Christ returning to gather up, his, uh, to resurrect his uh, departed saints. He brings them with him, uh, the, the dead in Christ, and then those of us who are alive and left will be caught up to meet the air in the Lord without passing through death. We will be immediately transformed and are glorified uh, as our departed brethren are also glorified. They receive their glorified body then, not in heaven, here when Christ comes back. And also we who are still in the flesh will also be transformed in the twinkling of an eye, which is a tiny fraction of a second. You'd have to measure that in milliseconds, I think. All right, so the solid biblical grounds for me to believe that. And it's not a thing, well, it could happen any time. The, the Bible is quite explicit. There are certain things that happen prior to the resurrection of the saints and the rapture of the living saints, okay? So let's look at that, and uh, we're going to look at some scriptures. And I've already gone over this before, but I want to put it together as a package, a little more concise than my usual rambling. So, uh, first of all, let's go over, uh, again, what I, want, I want to clarify something. When we, when we study the Bible, we want to look at what the Bible teaches. We want to look at the totality of biblical teaching, uh, and not just what one verse says, especially removed from context. So we want to uh, know especially what the apostles and Christ um, in some context, that might sound weird to you, but Christ preaching before his death and resurrection was often directed toward Israel, and he was preaching as someone under the law, under the covenant of Moses. After the resurrection, the church is not under the covenant of Moses, so we have to look to the apostles, too, to see if Christ and the apostles are saying the same thing. And we're not being confused with uh, a shift in covenants, or what some people say, dispensations. Yeah, it's actually the covenant thing that's a big deal there. Uh, the, the, the Old Testament covenant, it's like Jesus said that that uh, Moses was preached until uh, John the Baptist, and from then uh, uh, it's different. John the Baptist was preaching repentance and then uh, and preparing the way for Christ. And Christ was preaching to people that were still under the law because he had not died. No one could enter heaven. No one could be born again until Christ died on the cross. The Old Testament saints, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, David, they were not born again. The Holy Spirit was with them, but not in them. They could not receive the fullness of the new covenant uh, until... Christ had purchased it on the cross. It had to be brought into effect. God overlooked their sin with a mind toward the new covenant. But they could not enter into the, the, the much better promises of the new covenant, as is explained in the epistle to the Hebrews in the New Testament, until after Christ's atoning work was completed. Which is absolutely essential, because that removed the separation, especially from God's point of view, that as long as we were still in our sin and that sin hadn't been atoned for, in other words, as long as, even though God was inclined toward us in his, in his love and mercy and grace, because that's God's nature, 
But that's not all of God's nature. God is also holy and righteous. His justice is the same as the word righteousness. So his justice and his holiness demanded punishment for sin. It demanded his word be fulfilled. The wages of sin is death. The day you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. He did. Adam died spiritually. So God had this had to reconcile himself to man somehow by taking sin out of the way so that he could show grace and mercy to sinners on whom he was intent in saving. He was intent on salvaging his creation from the mess Satan, his adversary, had brought in through deception, although Adam wasn't deceived. Adam knew what he did. Was he was he knew before, what he was doing when he did it. Eve was deceived, Adam wasn't. Okay, so Jesus, a little bit of rabbit trail there, but important, we, we need to learn how to read the Bible properly. Always read it in context, and that also means the context of the whole. But we have to keep in mind uh, things like covenants, the old covenant, temporary covenant of Moses, and the new covenant, the eternal covenant of Christ, and when that came into effect. If you don't keep that right, you can, Jesus can be preaching the law to the Jewish nation, and you think that applies to you. Well, it doesn't directly, put it that way. We're not under the law if you're in Christ. So if you reject Christ, you're, the people are damned, not for sins they committed, but for rejecting God's salvation. God paid for the sins of the entire world when Jesus Christ died on that cross. But if you reject that, if you don't receive God's free gift of salvation that exists in Christ, and the free gift of eternal life that exists in Christ, if you refuse Christ, well, you get judgment. Because you've rejected that. That, that is a far worse sin than anything else you can do. Okay, so let's go look at what the Scripture says. Because I've come to the conclusion that... Uh, what is, has been commonly taught for over 100 years in the United States, a dispensationalism and the secret rapture and all this stuff and an antichrist coming, an individual, and he will take over the world and all these things, um, perhaps is not actually taught by Scripture. I will give it a possibility, okay? I, I certainly can be wrong. But if you look at the totality of what Scripture teaches, it doesn't seem to f correspond with what a lot of this other teaching. They, are, they have a preconceived notion, and they're reading it into Scripture often. So let's look at, and, and what I'm looking at specifically is, is two very important signs that the Bible says will occur prior to Christ's return to gather his saints together, both the those who have passed on and are in heaven with him today, and the living saints, the resurrection slash rapture. A lot of people have bad ideas about that, and, but so there, things have to happen. Now, that's commonly rejected. Uh, dispensationalism, which is very common in the United States among evangelicals and fundamentalists, evangelicals broadly, Pentecostalists now all pretty much agree on this, is that Christ will secretly come for his church, and then the tribulation and everything comes after that. After the church is removed, then the rest. They simply haven't read the scripture carefully. And some of their ideas come from a young lady who had some dreams, and they didn't even, they twisted even those. Uh, you know, the, the people that were responsible for some of these teachings were themselves, well, not the kind of people I would listen to. Men like John Darby and C.I. Schofield, uh, they had personal issues besides uh, doctrine. And if, if, if a teacher himself is, doesn't exhibit godly character, the fruit of the Spirit, um, we probably shouldn't listen to what they're teaching if they're exhibiting the works of the flesh. We sh probably shouldn't listen to what they're teaching. 
the love of money or idolatry or sexual perversion or all these things. We should not listen to what they're saying because they aren't even, even if they are a Christian, they are walking in the flesh and we should not uh, regard them as reliable sources. Only the scripture is reliable objectively. Going someplace else to outside sources beyond the scripture is an invitation to destruction, to terrible consequences. You are putting yourself out as bait for Satan. Oh, look it, there's another one. Let's get them. Like flies to a dead carcass. So we're going to talk about uh, not Christian so much, but the world. And the explosion that's taking place, the explosion of lawlessness. Just look at some of the videos on YouTube by people that have gone back to where they grew up or something. The cities in Oakland, L.A., San Francisco, Seattle, uh, you, know, you name it. Uh, uh, Portland, New York, Chicago, Boston, all these places. What the inner city now looks like. The core of the business district. Not the inner city slums, but the inner city business sections boarded up, still boarded up, and flooded with homeless, people defecating on the sidewalks. L.A. even has a daily poop map on the Internet so you can know where to walk where you won't have to step in some stuff because it's too thick. This is, this is, this is just crazy. Uh, but we're going to look at the Bible predicts this, and this is a very important sign indicating that Christ will return very soon. In fact, this has to take place prior to his return. All right, so let's start with, we're going to look at uh, multiple places that indicate this, and I might talk about some other ideas that aren't grounded very well in Scripture that are probably deceiving people. Th my purpose in this, I want you to be aware of, of what's going on and the time we're in. Uh, God doesn't uh, uh, leave his saints in the dark. The world will not understand what's going on, just like with, uh, with Noah. And the, when Jesus talked in, in um, Matthew 24 about like the days of Noah, he wasn't referring so much to the, uh, the, the wickedness of the people of that day in his particular discussion there, he was referring to the fact that no one, none of them, were aware of what was about to happen until God shut Noah and his family in the ark, and then the flood came, and then it was too late. All of a sudden they realized they didn't understand until the flood came. You know, they spent years mocking Noah, this st stupid old man out here building a huge boat in the middle of the desert or wherever it was. Well, God told him to, and he believed God, and he spared himself and his family by doing it. All right, so uh, let's first of all go over to Matthew. Am I going to go over to my right there? Matthew 24, because this is our Jesus, Jesus our Lord, talking about this. Now he's asked two questions. When will the temple be destroyed? So there's not one stone or another. That happened in 70 AD. And what will be the sign of your... Uh, return. So the two questions, and that's why it's a little bit tangled up here some places, not quite sure what he's referring to. But here is definitely referring to the time of the end, uh, the end of the age and your return. So that was the, the, uh, the second question, because he had said that the temple was going to be destroyed. Two separate questions. So don't conflate them. That we have to sort of untangle it here in Matthew 24. But we look to other places to see, too. And what do the apostles say about the end times? So because lawlessness shall will abound, will be multiplied. The love of many, actually, it's the majority uh, in the Greek. That would be New American Standard translates it as most, but uh, more than half. The many will grow cold. So you have 
people, the love of people for Christ, for God, will grow cold. This is the love of um, Christians, at least those that are considered Christians. Not necessarily those who are truly Christians. There are a lot of people are nominally, nominally Christian. Or they think they're Christian because of what somebody told them, or because they belong to a church, or because they were baptized in water, or whatever. Yes, I'm a Christian. Well, do you love Christ? Does Christ dwell in you? Do you love the brethren? Read First John. You'll find out how to tell whether you're really a born-again Christian and have the gift of eternal life or not. If you're a born-again Christian, you have eternal life. If you're not born again, well, Jesus said, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God, excuse me. He said kingdom of God. There's not a difference. It's just Matthew uses kingdom of heaven and John uses kingdom of God. Matthew was written more to a Jewish audience, okay? And that was, they didn't like using the word God. Okay. Uh, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many, or as I said, the majority, will grow cold. That's apostasy. Lawlessness because of the lawlessness, because of the multiplying of lawlessness, the love of the majority of Christians will grow cold. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. Okay? So we have the sign of lawlessness and apostasy, falling away from Christ, falling away from the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, now, so there's a lot of churches out there that have a that have a sound doctrine of Christ and what he accomplished, but their, their, their understanding of how that uh, applies to you is grossly wrong. It's by personal faith in Christ and his work. Period. It is not mediated by anyone besides Christ. Not a priest, not a sacrament, not an organization. Your faith in Christ, personal faith in the person of Christ. And you must be born again, and that's a personal work by God in you. If you want to find out the promises of the new birth, look in Jeremiah chapter 31, starting with about verse 31, and Ezekiel chapter 36, starting around verse 26, I believe. That's where the promises of the new covenant that Jesus spoke about at the Last Supper. This is the blood. He took the cup of wine. Not grape juice. Wine. <laughs> that, that just sounds so silly to me when, when priests, pastors, have to call it juice. <sighs> Foolish Americanisms. Amer the American Holiness Code. Don't you know that you, you're forbidden to drink alcohol? Well... Jesus made 80 gallons of wine, alcoholic wine, for a wedding when that grew, grew fell short of wine. And it was the best wine around. It was not the, it was it was it was not on fermented grape juice. What foolishness. What foolishness. Go by what the scripture says. A lot of people will not go there because they're afraid of what others will say. Well, I think that's sin. Well, then you don't believe the Bible. It is, drunkenness is sinful. Uh, being a drunkard, addicted to, to alcohol or drugs or something like that, will send you to hell. It will, because that is a manifestation you haven't been born again. It's, sinless perfection is not what the Bible teaches either. So, But because lawlessness will abound, abound or be multiplied, the love of the majority, will grow cold, but he that endures to the end shall be saved, to the return of Christ. He's talking to his disciples here, not to unbelievers, and not to a general Jewish audience, to his, to his close disciples. So let's go over to, now this is what Jesus says here, and th now, there's a section down here where it talks about the abomination of desolation and uh, fleeing to Jerusalem, f fleeing from Judea Jerusalem into the mountains from Judea and f fleeing quickly. Now, that seems to have been fulfilled in 70 AD during the Roman siege on the city. 
There were Christians in the city. It was a Passover celebration. The Christians were aware of what Jesus had said, and there were signs. There was actually signs in the heavens and the sky uh, indicating that it was, you know, right happening now. And they realized this, and God arranged for the Roman army uh, to leave there, and I believe go to the coast at Joppa to put down a, an uprising there that where some Romans had been killed. I think officers had been killed by the Jewish mob. Deal with that first and then come back and resume their siege. And in that short period of time, the Christians left. Christians did not die in the siege of Jerusalem because they saw the signs and left. So this, you know, the flight where he's talking about uh, from Jerusalem and Judea and the Romans were, you know, waging war against the entire Jewish nation in the land of uh, Galilee and Judea. So, that, so the, again, there's two questions that were asked. When would the temple be destroyed and what's the sign of your return and the end of the age? So let's go over to another passage that talks about the the uh, explosion of lawlessness. And we are seeing an explosion of lawlessness today. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 7 here. Uh, the entire chapter is talking about the return of Christ. But it says here, and I've got multiple translations on the screen, and the reason for that is there's some funky translation issues here. Uh, translating from Greek to English, translating any language into another language is difficult. And you, the translator almost cannot avoid doing some interpretations and inserting things because the languages are often structurally different, especially Greek and English. Uh, Greek and Spanish, you wouldn't have much of a problem. <laughs> Greek and English, yes. Because uh, it's English is uh, almost like a Creole. It's a, it's a mush language. It has all kinds of different influences in it. French, German. It's, it's, it's called a German, Germanic language. So it's not in the same family as the Romance languages of Greek and Italian and Latin, uh, uh, Spanish, French, Portuguese. They are in a different language family. I don't know enough about German other than they have very long words. Uh, but uh, English is part of that family with a lot of influence from other languages. But the basic structure is Germanic, not unsimilar. Although overall, the, the whole uh, uh, European language family is one family, not similar, on, unlike um, uh, Eastern languages like uh, uh, Chinese, Indo, it's Indo-European language family. So some of the languages from uh, the Indian area and in that part is also related to languages like German and Latin, apparently. You didn't need to know that, though, did you? The mystery of iniquity or lawlessness, lawlessness, anomia, that means without law. The, Greek, the word there in the Greek is anomia, without law. So iniquity uh, is often translated that in the King James, but you see here in the New King James, New American Standard, and Young's Literal, which is an older, uh, it's based on the same manuscripts as the King James, but it's a l very literal rendering. It's not meant for common use. It's like a study thing. Uh, shows you clo it's closer to the original Greek, and because of that, is can be a little bit rocky, but it's useful. See, it's useful, and it's free. It's out of copyright. The same uh, person created this, I believe, is that created the Young's uh, Exhaustive Concordance, which is also a very good and useful concordance, but it only works with the King James. <clears throat> you should have one. It's good. Uh, 
uh, for the secret of lawlessness, the mystery is something that's now being revealed. It's it's something that has been hidden and not understood in the past, and now it's being revealed, particularly here. For the mystery of lawlessness, or the, the hidden nature of this, is already at work. Uh, this is this is the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of Satan working in the children of disobedience. Um, and uh, so this has been here for quite a while, since, oh, 6,000 years or so. And only, only he who now restrains, and this is why I want to look at this, he, don't take that as a pronoun necessarily referring to a person. Greek is a gendered language like Spanish and many others. And the pronoun or adjective must have the same gender as the noun. Uh, Greek has three genders. There's no languages with more than three genders that I've ever heard of. Uh, some languages only have two. Uh, language, older languages tend to be more complicated, more extensive, and they tend to simplify over time. Uh, but uh, Span Spanish have has two, I think, might have some neuter in it, but not much. But anyways, it's uh, masculine, feminine, and neuter are the three genders. And again, the pronoun must agree in gender. That's how they don't use word order very much in these languages. So they're, 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 the word, the adjective, or the pronoun is connected to the noun by having matching gender. If you know Spanish or other languages like this, you understand exactly what I'm saying. But English only speakers or people that haven't studied other languages at all? I mean, this is really basic and in, you know, first semester of all of these other languages. Uh, then you're, that I'm talking to you. So when it says, he who restrains, the New King James capitalized that, inferring it was God or the Holy Spirit. I object. I object. You don't have a basis to do that. They're inserting their pre- existing beliefs into their translation or edition of the New King James. Bad. So all of these say he, because that's literally what the Greek uses. It uses a masculine pronoun. But it doesn't mean an individual. In English, we see that and we think it refers to a masculine person. Not likely. There's more masculine nouns than there are masculine male nouns. They refer to a male person. Okay? There's all kinds of masculine words. Most of them aren't living things at all. Like law, the word namas. Law, like anomia lawlessness namas is a masculine noun so it would take a masculine pronoun so whatever you should say that which is restraining or what it is that is restraining but that's a little awkward okay he can mislead you in english that's why i'm telling you this it's important uh, there's lots of other areas in the bible where uh and other people have you know what is the restrainer here well, some people say it's a church, some people say it's the Holy Spirit, but the word spirit is not masculine, it is neuter. God, that th us is masculine. But all kinds of words are masculine, so just keep it open, all right? That that which restrains would be something like that would be better. Because of the problems in English and translating from Greek to English, okay? Uh, so, but this, this misleads a lot of people. So the, the common view among evangelicals, the, 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 which believe almost all of them are influenced strongly by dispensationalism, is this is like the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the world uh, when the church is raptured, and only after that, will the lawlessness and stuff take, uh, be revealed. That directly contradicts what Paul is saying in this section. He says this must happen first. Uh, whatever is holding it back, okay, and we're, 
going to look at that a little bit. What holds us back? Is there other scripture that talks about something that holds it back? Restraints. What restrains lawlessness? What restrains sinful human beings, generally speaking? In society. Namas? Law? Punishment? Fear? Of various things? Does the Holy Spirit restrain unregenerate people that do not have do not have the Holy Spirit? Jesus didn't say anything about that. He said when the Holy Spirit comes, he will be sent into the world to convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment, of the sin of not believing in Christ. People have a conscience. People have a certain light from God that we're commonly referred to as uh, natural law, where Paul talks about in Romans, um, I think it's the first chapter, where he talks about it, they show that the work of, of the law is written in their hearts. Uh, they have some innate God-given, well, innate and God-given are two different things, really, but they have some uh, light from God, illumination from God, that they have some knowledge of right and wrong, and they demonstrate that through their actions. It's amazing how some person, like a thief, who will justify his actions, but as soon as somebody steals from him, he will condemn them. So the scripture says, Paul teaches, that they are condemned because they condemn other people, say that the other person does, does wrong, especially to them, you wronged me, when they do the same thing. See, they reveal they have a knowledge of right and wrong when they condemn other people for what they do, for what the other person does, but they, they're, they're, they themselves will do the same thing and justify themselves. Shows there's something in them that tells them right and wrong. Conscience, the scripture talks we have a conscience. Of course, consciences can be seared. They can be, conscience has to be sort of educated. Uh, you can have things on your conscience that are not uh, bad. They are not sins. They are not contrary to the word of God because of culture and other things. Society has a restraint. It used to have restraint. Uh, the social order and uh, the, the pressure to conform to the social order. Marriage is a restraint. I mean, all, uh, government is a restraint ordained by God to punish evildoers and reward those who do good. All these things function to restrain sin, but nowhere does the Holy does the Bible say the Holy Spirit restrains sin. God has occasionally prevented people from doing something, but he doesn't do that generally. He has ordained other things because God God will keeps his distance from sinful people, especially before the cross before he atoned for the sins of the world. Because of his holiness and his righteousness. Not that he... He had, to get, he had a problem. How do you deal with rebels that you love and still be, be a righteous judge? The way was the cross. Sending his own son into the world to die for the sins of the world. So God was free to be both just, this is right out of the book of Romans, and the justifier of those who believe in Christ. He justifies sinners, the unrighteous. And he can do that only because of the cross. Okay, so here we see Paul's talking about this. Let's go down a verse. Uh, I'm going to Go in this mode here. Then the lawless one, the word one is not present in the text. Again, this is a New King James issue. It might also be in some of the others. Then, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, uh, New American Standard says, the, the, the King James said, then that wicked be revealed. Uh, better than this. It's Lawless is better, but the lawless one is not in the original language. It is not implied by the original language. 
There's no one there at all. It's a singular, but it's not. See, again, this is, this is make, giving the impression it's a particular person. When the Greek actually says, the lawless. Says so right here. <laughs> See this this says the lawless. And it's a singular, it's a masculine, but namas is a masculine verb, and this is a namas with a uh, an, uh, the negative particle prefix on it, I think. Okay. So it's it's a masculine word, and it doesn't say ma it doesn't say one anywhere. There's a Greek word for that. It's not present. They are reading that in because of their presuppositions, preconceived notions of what this is referring to. Then that lawless then that lawless will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. When the Lord returns in the book of Revelation, what does he slay? All the armies of the world that are gathered together against him. The idea that the beast is, a, is one individual is not found in the Greek. The idea of uh, <coughs> that lawless the the enomas or hono, ha, honomas the the lawless one sort of here is a category can, in the Greek can be a category a type of human beings a description of a of a particular generation for example human beings the sons of uh, uh, of Adam in a particular time right before Lord, uh, Christ returned. I believe that is probably the proper way to interpret it. It can be interpreted as a particular individual, but that is not consistent with what the Bible teaches about the last days. That is an interpretation, and I believe a improper interpretation. In some cases it might be grammatically okay, but in light of other t passages, uh, it doesn't make sense. Jesus didn't talk about, oh, watch out for the coming of the of the Antichrist. No, it's something else. It is the time, the human beings at that time will be lawless. Lawlessness will multiply, and that's what we see going on today. Okay, let's go another place. Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Again, we see something about lawlessness. Why do the nations rage? That's, that's goy, that is nations, the non-Jews. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain or useless or empty thing? The king, so you have the, the nations and the people, the kings of the earth set themselves or take their seats, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. That's Yahweh, the capital L O R D indicates it's Yahweh, God's Old Testament name, the name he revealed to Moses, and his anointed. Anointed is the word uh, Mashiach. In Hebrew, in Greek, it's Christ, Christus, the anointed one. Christ is the anointed of God. He is God's appointed one. The, the, the kings and the prophets were anointed as a sign that they were chosen by God, anointed with oil. Okay? It's part of the law of Moses. But the Christ, the word Christ, means the anointed one, the, the special one. The one that would come uh, like Moses to deliver his people. The one that Moses said, Whosoever will not listen to that one shall be cut off. And that corresponds exactly with the teaching of the New Testament that salvation is only in Christ. Those who reject him, who refuse to listen to him, well, they're cut off. That's, they go to the other place. They're not 
they do not enter the kingdom of God. Go to that uh, uh, dump, that landfill, that uh, eternal prison that's called hell or the lake of fire. And what do they say? The people and, and, the, and their leaders are saying, let us break their bonds, the Lord's bonds and Christ's bonds, his anointed's bond, in pieces, their bonds, handcuffs, shackles, fetters, and cast away their cords, ropes, from us. Restraints. Cast away restraint, the restraints that God has put in place. His law, his commandments, his, the conscience given, the, the light given that's called natural law. Uh, that the knowledge all people have that God exists and that he's God and it, the revelation of his power in creation. All created things testify that God is. In addition to other knowledge that's out there, the special revelation is the scriptures. He who sits in heaven shall laugh. It's, it's futile. It's a vain thing. It's stupid. It's ridiculous. The Lord will hold them in derision, scorn. Then he will speak to him in his wrath, his anger, to the world. That, read the book of Revelation. The final judgments of God, especially the, judge, the bowls of, of judgment or vials, depending on your, your translation you're reading, this, this is where the, 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 the final wrath, God's anger in Revelation uh, has twofold purpose. One is uh, a last-ditch call for sinners to repent and turn to God and ask Him to save them. All they got to do is ask, call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the, on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But once the judge comes, too late, too late. You got to make a deal before the judge comes, and the deal is you conform to what God has said. You agree to receive his salvation. Turn yourself over to God. He will save you. But if you refuse, well, his wrath remains on you. John chapter 3, verse 36. So this is uh, God's response is, yet, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. That is the Messiah. That is Jesus Christ. He is coming not as Savior for the world, but as God, as king, and as judge. I will declare the decree. Now this is the the anointed one, this is Jesus Christ speaking here, the Son of God, the one who is coming. The Lord had said to me, God, the Father, you are my Son, today I have begotten thee. This refers to the incarnation, I believe. Some others have a strange idea of eternal begetting, but it says today, that is a time. The day he was begotten of Mary. Today I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. Now this is a thousand years before Christ. Turn to the book of Revelation, you'll find out how it comes out. You shall break them with a rod of iron. That's ruling in absolute power. The rod of iron is a display of the strength of the kingdom. It cannot, it, not something that can be broken very easy. No, Christ will rule in absolute power. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel, like a vessel of clay. They'll be broken. Therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with tw trembling. Kiss the Son... See, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ a thousand years before Christ came. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Get right with God before Christ returns. In other words, blessed are all those, happy are all those who put their trust in him. 
not in an institution, not in a sacrament, not in a, a denomination, but in him. Salvation is personal. It's between you and God in Christ. Faith in Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Personally. It's a personal relationship with him. It's not mediated. Our relationship with God as a, as a son of God is, or child of God is mediated only by Jesus Christ and nothing else. He is the one mediator between God and man. None others. Mary's not there. The Roman Catholic Church is not there. Um, Muhammad is not there. Joseph Smith is not there. Only Christ is the mediator. He is the only anointed one. Chosen by God. Sent by God. As Savior and then coming as judge. All right? So we see lawlessness here. Cast their cords, God's cords, God's restraints. So it's plural, cords and bonds or fetters. Cast them away. Get rid of, we're going to get rid of the chains and we're going to get rid of the ropes that bind us. We are going to party and do what we want with no restraints. And this is a prophecy of the return of Christ. He is coming as judge. Not a prophecy of his coming as Savior, but as judge. Okay, so we have in the scriptures, in these three scriptural sections here, uh, all three agree that before Christ returns, there will be this, this time of just lawlessness where the nations and their rulers and those in power cast off restraints deliberately. Let us get away... Get rid of God's restraints. What are we doing? Getting rid of marriage, getting rid of the, uh, the ordinance of creation, which is marriage, and even gender. Destroy that. Destroy everything. Every, all the works of God. We're going to annihilate it all, and we're going to build our own world. God won't be invited. He's persona non grata. We're going to do whatever we want. Just children of Satan. Just having a party. Their last party. Their last meal before the execution of the sentence of God. Foolish. Partying on the edge of hell. Giving God the middle finger. Read Revelation. You'll see that in there. Just in spite of the judgments of God, they refuse to repent of their idolatry, of their thefts, of their murders, of their immorality. They refuse. They don't care. Do what you will, God. We will not repent. Not a good plan. But when it talks in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians, I'm going to go back there, about the man of, of sin, the man of lawlessness, Again, I, I believe that is a category of people that is the, the particular people of the world at the time, right before Christ returns, when lawlessness abounds. That is exactly what we're seeing today. Nothing like this, it, what's going on today, has happened in the world. Now, there's been lawlessness here and there, whether there's Sodom and Gomorrah, there was uh, times of lawlessness here and there, there was... Uh, uh, libertinism has taken place in certain places and sexual immorality there and whatever. But as a general global thing that envelops most of the inhabited world, especially the Western world, Europe, Western Europe and the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, this lawlessness that we've seen and we've we've seen the tyranny that's actually right under the under the surface, in in countries like Australia, the United States, Canada. The, these people are, these rulers, these kings that are supposed to be democratically elected are actually tyrants, given the opportunity. So let's go to something else here. Let's go to Galatians, uh, chapter five. Now, the children of Adam are the children of disobedience. They're the result of Adam's disobedience, and they are born into that. 
Jesus said, you must be born again. He said, that which is born of, unless a man is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. The water refers to natural birth. And born, born of the Spirit uh, refers to being born again, because that's one of the promises of uh, being the new covenant, of the new birth. It's mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 31, and I believe in Ezekiel chapter 36, that with the Holy Spirit, that God will put his Spirit in his people. Now, born of water, some people confuse that with water baptism. That's not what it's referring to. Jesus in the next sentence says, that which is born of flesh... This is a parallel, typical Hebraic construction. You find it in Psalms and other places all the time. You say it one way, and you say it another way. Jewish poetry, that which is born of flesh, referring to that which is born of water, and born of the Spirit, referring to that which is born of the Spirit. You must be born of flesh and born of the Spirit. Born once into this world and born a second time into the kingdom of God not referring to water baptism at all but when people see something like water they just oh baptism no that's not what that means no you look at the text understand it do a little research find out what baptism meant back then too all right so if you're not born again then you're born of adam you're a child of the devil uh because adam you're, you're uh, the children of disobedience. And you, you're the, the Paul, in the New Testament, when it talks about the, the flesh, it's referring to what we get from Adam. We are born of him, and everything we receive from him, the scripture refers to as the flesh, natural man, the old man. The Adamic man. He's the first Adam. There's a second Adam that's called Jesus Christ. Which is of the spirit. The new birth. Okay? So the works, uh, the, work, the, the new man, if you're born again, you have a new creation in you, along with the flesh. The flesh is still there as long as you're in this body. So you can still do the deeds of the flesh. The works of the flesh. But the fruit of the spirit is produced in that new man. And only in that. If you're not born again, there's no fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit is not in you, cannot be in you, until you have faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Because he can't dwell in that mess. No, he's holy, just like the Father is holy. He's righteous, just like the Father is righteous. And if he was to move into a... Uh, uh, a sinful house, it would incinerate. What happened to some people in the Old Testament? What happened to Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament? They just lied about their offerings. They were, God put them to death. They, the whole, you know, when, when, when you're in the very presence of God, and because of the, the Holy Spirit had just been out, poured out, and the, the, it was so manifest and heavy, just like in the Old Testament when they were. Uh, after they've been delivered from Egypt and they, they would sin and they would get these plagues. You can't you can't mess around with God like that. And if you're not uh, trusting in Christ's salvation, you have you, your sin is still all over the place. Still covered with that stuff. So the works of the flesh is what all the children of Adam do. Now, these can be restrained or not restrained. Uh, Jesus said to look at a woman and to lust after her is adultery. It says to hate someone is to be a murderer. What he's referring to is that the sin is conceived in your heart. So if you want to do these things and would do them if there was no restraint, uh, you committed the act. It's the same as committing the act. God sees the heart. People look on the outside. Now, a person may look on a woman to lust after her and not follow through with that for all kinds of reasons. But to, to desire, to if you had no restraints and nothing holding you back, you would do it. That's what Jesus is saying. It's just the restraints that prevent you. So you're still guilty because that's what you want to do in your heart. Okay? So these, these works of the flesh, 
people that are restrained will generally not do them. People that aren't restrained, who have cast off the restraints of God that come from government and family and society and education perhaps and other things, conscience, the uh, uh, natural law that your certain knowledge of right and wrong that's in you, uh, people that cast off those restraints, they'll do them. They'll do them. They'll do whatever they want. It's what we see today. The, inter the YouTube is full of videos about people just ripping off Walgreens on the corner. This, the big cities are just, well, it's they're turning into hell. There's no, the people have no restraint. They're lawless. There's no law restraining them. And the authorities have cast away law, too. Remember the riots under Trump? Antifa burning the federal courthouse. Uh, well, children will be children. First of all, if you're, if you're more than 18 years, if you're 18 or older, you're not a child. If you're a college student, you're not a child, in spite of what they say all the time. All those children in college. People in college are not children. If you can beget children, you're not a child anymore. If you've gone through puberty, you're not a child. You're a young adult. Period. But the society now wants to coddle you. They cast off restraints. They cast off punishments. Oh, let's get rid of the police. Let's let's defund the police. Let's make uh, shoplifting a non-thing. Uh, we'll we'll just uh, remove all the penalties for drug abuse. They're doing that. Remove all the penalties from from divorce. Remove all the penalties from abortion. Remove all the penalties from everything. Go do what you want. That's where we are today. The leaders. Have, cast, have assisted the people in casting off all the restraints. Don't you dare mention God. That's where we are. The days of lawlessness are here. Lawlessness is exploding. And it will not stop. This is a, a sign that has never been fulfilled in the past on any kind of a broad scale. It's going on today. And because of, Jesus said, as a, a consequence of the exploding of lawlessness, many people that would normally call themselves a Christian, be nominally a Christian, maybe because they were raised in the church or, or something, but, but have not actually been born again, they're falling away. Because they don't want to suffer persecution, tribulation, which is pressure. See, the world is putting pressure on all of us, on Christians. Have you not noticed? They want us to conform to their crazy party, like that uh, Burning Man party out there that God rained on. Put their fire out. Ha! Gave them three inches of mud to walk in. I think that's a hoot. <laughs> you want to stick your finger in God's eye? Well... Watch him stick his finger back. Don't mess with God. Call upon him to save you. That's what's going on today. This wild lawlessness from the top down. And the kings and the rulers of this world are taking their seat together, sitting together. Davos. I fell down the Davos rabbit hole the, uh, yesterday. I happened to look into that a little bit. The the 1,000 biggest corporations, to be a member of Davos, you have to have a, or, uh, a World Economic Forum. They just meet at Davos in Switzerland. Geneva, Canton of Geneva and Switzerland, uh, early in January sometime usually, unless COVID shuts it down, which it did one year. So these and the court today the corporations these big corporations are more powerful than governments especially in the west democracies because they simply buy the politicians if you have a stupid political system like in the united states and you allow corporations to con contribute thank you supreme court you dunderheads what'll happen they'll just buy them that's what's going on 
I don't know how many lobbies to know. It used to be K Street and J Street. We do all kinds of things for foreign governments who put money in the pockets of politicians like Israel. Why do they get so much money? Because of J Street and the, and the Jewish pop. Half the Jews in the world live in the United States. The other half live in Israel. And there's a few scattered around other places, but hardly any. So the, the state of Israel simply buys the politicians. They want something? They know who to grease. They got a bunch of lobbyists there. There are people in the United States, you know, dual citizenship. No man can serve two masters. I don't understand that concept at all. How do you do that? I don't have dual citizenship. I have citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the United States is just confused about me because I was born here. Physically, they think I'm a citizen here. But no, my citizenship is in heaven. And that will be evident shortly. <laughs> Yes, we are not of them. But the, the, we are in tribulation. We are being seriously pressured. And serious persecution against Christians in the United States. Losing your business, lo use, lose your job, be canceled. Uh, soon there'll be your bank account will disappear, like in Canada. Oh, uh, they contributed to something we don't like. The personal head of state in Canada, Trudeau, will just take their bank accounts away. We'll lock up their bank accounts. They can't get to their money. So they can starve. These people are monsters. See, what's being revealed right before judgment, the, the restraints are being... Are, people are removing their own restraints, and, and this is, sets them up for judgment because this is evidence that will be presented before the court. So this is what God is displaying, what human beings are like, the children of Adam are like, if they are on restraint. Their true nature without cords and handcuffs to prevent them from doing what they want to do. Right before God's judgment. So there'll be no question about their guilt. Because there'll be piles of evidence. No one would be able to say that God is unjust. You have to find God's salvation before the judge takes his seat. Because then it's too late. If you don't want to be judged with the world, you've got to accept the terms of the king who is the savior now, while the offer still stands. For, so it will not stand forever. Once Jesus Christ comes, uh-uh. Not open anymore. It's a limited time offer. Make sure you possess the kingdom of God. Make sure that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. That you have real personal faith in Christ and what he did for sinners. For you. <laughs>